So last time we start, started talking about the Nernst equation, and just to summarize that, the Nernst equation is basically telling us um, the amount of, of maximum work or the reversible work that we can generate with a fuel cell on a per coulomb basis, energy per coulomb that we pass through the cell. Um, and so what I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about um, what does that mean in terms of fuel usage in the cell? So kind of translating this back to the material balance question and how do we go about that? And that, that takes us to the second of two ma major equations that um, I, I think it's important to keep in your mind all the time. So one of them is the Nernst equation, um, but the other is, is Faraday's law. So let me talk about Faraday's law for a second. Uh, so the basic idea is if you have a cell and we're passing a certain amount of current through that cell, meaning electrons going in the bottom and coming out the top, positive charge is flowing from top to bottom in this example. Um, at the same time, we're feeding through the cell a certain amount of fuel. And producing exhaust. And we see that manifest in the gas phase. So we've got a certain amount of gas, gaseous fuel that we feed in and then some gases come out. Some of it might still be fuel, some of it's the exhaust gases. Uh, we put in air, depleted air comes out. Um, and we usually think about that in terms of an extent of reaction. So like think about this from a kind of like 310 or 326 per, 325 perspective or if, uh, you know reaction engineering we have a certain amount of extent of reaction um, which has units of moles per second which is the consumption of fuel how does that relate to the current well that comes back to I think our picture of the cell that we looked at last time we just take as an example this sort of picture we have of a solid oxide fuel cell. We, we have two reactions that are going on, one at the anode and one at the cathode. And those two reactions are tied to each other because of the flow of the current. If we're producing a certain number of electrons, uh, one electrode, we're consuming those same electrons or the same number of electrons at the other electrode certain number of ions are going through the cell. All that is happening in lockstep with the consumption of fuel. So we're, we're taking two oxygen molecules, consuming eight electrons, producing four ions. Those four ions consume one fuel molecule and one produce one CO2 and two waters and produce the two eight electrons on the other side. Um, and so the, the consumption of the fuel, in this case, we're, we're consuming one CH4 molecule, and in the process of doing that, eight electrons have to transfer across the cell. And we've already talked a little bit about that in the context of the Nernst potential. That NF factor shows up when we're talking about the energy uh, released from that reaction. Well, the same thing applies to, to consumption. If we're reacting a certain amount of CH4, we're flowing eight electrons per CH4 molecule, and that translates to a certain amount of a fuel usage tied to the current. And, and because those two things are in lockstep and related through the NF number of electrons transferred, uh, we can calculate it directly. And that's, that's basically what Faraday's law is. So uh, we can write that the current uh, is equal to NF times the reaction rate in this case. We're reacting a certain number of methane molecules and we multiply that by eight and then by F, and that gives us in coulombs, the amount of current that we're flowing through the cell at that rate. Um, and that's really all there is to Faraday's law. Um, the one thing I think where things get a little bit confusing, and the reason I'm bringing it up so explicitly like this is that um, is what happens when you have a stack of cells. Because we're almost never gonna run a single cell. We're gonna be operating some type of engineered stack device, which has multiple cells in series. And so the question always comes up, well, how do you apply Faraday's law 
in a system where you're distributing the fuel over many cells. And so I just want to kind of walk through that a little bit. So to remind you, when I was talking about a stack last time, we have a series of cells. I'm going to use the letter M, as in Michael, to indicate the number of cells. And we're talked a little bit about a lot of time what happens to the voltage. We measure the voltage across the whole stack. We expect that to be a um, the, the, the cell voltage added up. So each cell, if we have M identical cells, we could multiply by the cell voltage by M and that would give us the total stack voltage that we would expect. And then meanwhile, through the stack, we're passing a certain amount of current. That current is going through every cell. So the current on a cell is equal to the current on a stack. It's not distributed amongst the cells. It goes through all the cells. But the fuel is being distributed because we're taking the fuel, we're feeding it to the stack, and then we're distributing that fuel across each cell, hopefully identically. So. Likewise, we might say that the utilization, or excuse me, the consumption rate uh, on the cell, on one cell, this is equal to one over M times the consumption rate for the whole stack. So if we're consu consuming a certain amount of fuel on the cell, we multiply by that by M, that's gonna give us the total amount of fuel that we're consuming for the whole stack. So where does Faraday's law apply? Faraday's law is going to apply wherever we're passing a current. So if we think about one cell, we would say that I on the cell is equal to NF times Xi dot for that cell. It's not related to the stack consumption because um, we're only consuming that fuel at that one cell. So putting that all together, the work rate or the power in this case that we're producing from the stack, this would equal voltage times current. So I can take the stack voltage times the current on the stack. And if I translate that back to the individual cells, that would be M times V cell times I of the cell, which is just equal to the stack current. And then if I further apply Faraday's law, then this would be M times V cell times NF times Xi dot of the stack divided by M. And what we can see is the two factors of M cancel. So M cancels M. And we end up with the work rate being NF times V cell times the consumption rate of the stack, which is an interesting result because it's saying it doesn't matter how many cells we have. If we know V cell and we know how much fuel we're consuming in the stack as a whole, it doesn't matter what the number of cells is, though the power is determined by, by V cell, not by, not by the stack voltage per se. And then if we take this one step further, if I think about the minimum work, or excuse me, in this case, the maximum work for fuel cell, um, the reversible work, meaning that if we did everything reversibly, how much is the maximum amount of power this fuel cell could produce? Well, that would occur when V cell is equal to V equilibrium. So this would be NF 
times V equilibrium. V equilibrium we're predicting from the Nernst equation times xi dot of the stack. And to remind you, V equilibrium can also be expressed in terms of the Gibbs free energy. So this would be NF times minus delta G of reaction divided by NF times psi dot of the stack. So there you have it. It's telling us that the reversible work that we can produce from this fuel cell is equal to the Gibbs free energy of the reaction times the consumption rate of the fuel. So we've completely now bypassed all of the electrochemical considerations. We're just now thinking what goes in, what goes out. We're, we're reacting a certain amount of fuel. We're doing that reaction reversibly. We should get X amount of work out of that. And that's what it's reflecting. How would this change at all if we put cells in parallel or would we just never do that for any reason? You can put cells in parallel. Yeah, that happens all the time. If you have, if you have, um, a, a, you know, if your electrical requirements are are really great, you, you know, if you tried to do it with a single stack, then what you might have is just these enormous cells that are too big to manufacture, and so in that case, you would have multiple stacks that are in par or are in parallel with each other. In a way, that's a much simpler situation because the voltages are the same because they're in parallel and you're just adding up the current and fuel flow for each stack to give you the total current flow. So I think that that, that scales in a more natural way than we think about it. just where we double the number of fuel cells, we're doubling the amount of fuel consumption, we're doubling the amount of current, everything gets bigger extensively in, in the way that we normally think about it. We can also flip this around and ask the question, if we produce, produce a certain amount of electricity reversibly, how much fuel would we need? And, um, and so let's take as in our example, I've been using as a working example, this 20 kilowatt um, rack in a data center as an example. How much fuel would we need minimally to produce that power using a fuel cell? Um, so we can flip this around and say that psi dot, psi dot of our stack, this would be uh, W rev. And this is, I'm talking about the minimum fuel usable that we have. This would be W rev divided by 8F because we're passing eight electrons per methane molecule times V equilibrium. And we calculated that last time using the Nernst equation. So this would be our 20,000 watts. And then we're dividing by eight, 96,485 coulombs per mole. And then 1.03 volts, which I believe is the Nernst equation we calculated last time. Um, a volt is a joule per coulomb. So that's giving us moles per second of methane. And this was uh, will be 0 0.025 moles per second. This would be the minimum amount of fuel we would have to feed in order to produce that much electricity if we did everything reversibly.